Good morning, everybody, or, or good afternoon, because um, some of you um, are, are, of course, in Europe or, or in, well, still Europe, from Russia. It's a great honour to open the 2022 Monterey Symposium today. And despite the fact that I know you're all waiting to hear um, Tom Graham's keynote speech, I hope you'll forgive me for making some opening remarks. As an alumna of the Monterey Symposium in 2018, I feel very confident that I wouldn't have had the career advancement I've had today without having attended the symposium, and in particular, without having benefited from Anna Brisevna's vision for a space in which young, upcoming Russia scholars can learn from the best experts in a truly bilingual environment and also a bicultural one, and of course, from a genuinely wide range of views. Certainly, that was my experience of the symposium in 2018, and it's, well, bluntly, it's just a dream opportunity to have become a co-director of, of a symposium from which I derived so much and, and to be able to reinvest my efforts into it for, for future cohorts. And it's for that reason that I would like to, to signal my gratitude to Anna Borisovna for her tireless intensive efforts to create the symposium and, of course, to, to Carnegie Corporation of New York for making it possible. But of course, there's something else to mention. Since 2018, the need for this symposium and for the wider work of, of Monterey Initiative in Russian Studies has, has multiplied tremendously. Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, its, uh, its war of aggression against Ukraine and um, demonstrated contempt for, for Ukrainian sovereignty casts a long shadow over our professions and, and future professions. We um, here at Monterey Initiative and Russian Studies, of course, condemn the war in the strongest terms. But while these statements are necessary, we can't just leave it there and, and sit feeling morally sated. Uh, what good will that do anyone? Instead, we think that while it may seem provocative to some, now is exactly the time to commit more fervently than ever to the most basic tenet of our work um, and of all those interested in diplomacy and understanding other cultures, namely to facilitate genuine understanding. We need to work out how we got to this catastrophe, why so many were surprised, what did we all miss as, as a profession. We need to understand why a significant number of Russians do support the war, why, um, why Putin declared the war. We need to understand the logic and we need to arrive at a form of strategic empathy, not to agree, not to sympathize, but simply to understand so that we can better, better forecast, better react, better respond. In part, we've tried to do this by the reordering and refocusing of, this, of, of the syllabus of the symposium, as we discussed with you previously. But of course, this will continue to reverberate in many ways. This war will define and determine your entire careers opportunities that were available even to me will not be available to many of you. Doors are closing, especially to visa centers. <laughs> Reality makes opportunities like these for, for unselfconscious engagement with Russian experts and, and buddy experts all the more valuable. They were already rare, but now it's unique. But for this format to flourish, it depends on you, on the energy that you put into it or in the energy you put into the readings and the questions on your openness to listen. Let us disagree strenuously if needs be, but let's do so in good faith and hear the other side out and then counter them with better arguments, with clearer evidence, with more thoughtful reasoning. And who better to prime us all for these discussions than Thomas Graham? Within the field of Russian studies, he hardly needs an introduction, but I think it's probably appropriate that I still provide one. Thomas Graham is a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He's co-founder of the Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies Programme at Yale, and he sits on its faculty steering committee. He's also a research fellow at the Macmillan Centre at Yale, where he teaches a course on US-Russian relations. He was special assistant to the president and senior director for Russia on the National Security Council staff from 2004 to 2007, during which time he managed a White House Kremlin strategic dialogue. He was also director for Russian affairs on the staff from 2002 to 2004. 
In addition to this, he it's such a wonderful career. Thomas Graham was a foreign service officer for 14 years and with assignments, including two tours of duty at the US embassy in Moscow in the late Soviet period and in the middle of the 1990s. Between tours in Moscow, he worked on Russian and Soviet affairs on the policy planning staff of the US Department of State. He now serves on the Kennan Council of the Kennan Institute of the Wilson Center and on the advisory board of Russia Matters, a project of the Belfer Center at Harvard with the goal of enhancing understanding of Russia among policymakers. He also serves on the editorial board of the US Canada Journal of the USA Canada Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences and gained his PhD in political science from Harvard University. And with all that said, ladies and gentlemen of the uh, Monterey Symposium cohort for 2022, I would like to introduce Thomas Graham. Thank you very much. Uh, Jay, for that very kind introduction uh, and those, I think, very important words at the beginning about uh, the the nature of the, the task we're undertaking uh, over the next several weeks. Uh, first, my welcome to all of you. Um, I regret that we can't do this in person. Uh, we've been doing Zoom now for the past two years. Um, it was a wonderful invention initially that allowed us to maintain contact, uh, but I think it's it's worn on all of us. Uh, and we all long for that human contact uh, that really makes these, these meetings much more lively and much more energetic. Um, Jay said that uh, it's, been a, it's a difficult moment for, for those of us who are, are studying uh, Russia, engaged in uh, dealing with, uh, with making a, the making of Russia policy. I would simply say that it's been a deeply trying time uh, for those of us like me who have been engaged in trying to build constructive relations with Russia for the past 35 to 40 years. Um, if you think back, or if you read back into the, the late Soviet period, there's a time of great expectation uh, throughout the United States, uh, the Soviet Union and Russia itself, about the possibilities uh, as Russia was re-entering uh, the global environment after 70 years of isolation under communist rule. Uh, in the West, we thought we had a grand opportunity uh, to integrate Russia into the Western uh, community, the Euro-Atlantic community, uh, as a free market democracy. Uh, and that, uh, I think that the excitement grew in the early years after the breakup of the Soviet Union. We went through three cycles of what I call great expectations uh, for relations between Russia and the West, uh, followed by severe disappointment as each American administration under Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama uh, found that their greatest hopes for relationship uh, were not going to materialize during their two terms in office. Uh, this, these cycles of ex expectation uh, and, and disappointment came to a very abrupt end, as we all know, in 2014, uh, with the Russian seizure of Crimea uh, and the instigation uh, of rebellion in eastern, uh, in, eastern, in eastern Ukraine. And at that point, we realized that this grand project of integrating Russia had it failed at least in the short term, and it was not clear when it might return. Indeed, relationships began to spiral downward after 2014. Uh, remember the, the Russian incursion into Syria in 2015 uh, that challenged the United States and what we were trying to do uh, in that part of the world. And then, of course, there was the interference in the presidential elections in 2016, uh, which uh, produced uh, an enduring anti-Russian bipartisan consensus uh, in the United States. So already uh, by the beginning of this year, uh, relations between the United States and Russia, between the West and Russia, were probably at their lowest point since the beginning uh, of the Cold War. And then the Russian, Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th. I think today uh, the situation is reminiscent of the situation in 1983, a year that was one of the darkest in the second half of the Cold War. The beginning of 1983, Ronald Reagan called Russia, the Soviet Union at that time, the evil empire. Several weeks later, he launched what he called the Strategic Defense Initiative, dubbed Star Wars at that time, uh, which from the Russian standpoint would undermine a key, uh, a, a key foundation of strategic stability. At that time, the United States uh, was engaged in a proxy war against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, uh, funding the Mujahideen with, with weapons, 
uh, and diplomatic support uh, in a conflict that ent ultimately ended in the humiliation of the Soviet Union three or four years later. Uh, in September of 1983, uh, the Soviets uh, shot down a, a commercial airline, Korean Airlines 007 over Sakhalin, killing nearly 300 the nearly 300 people that are on board and led to a, a tremendous uh, amount of outrage in the West. Uh, in response, the Russians cut off all negotiations of arms control agreements at that point that were going on in Geneva. Uh, and to make matters even more dangerous, uh, in the fall uh, of that year, we came close to nuclear conflict on two occasions, one for technological reasons, another for psychological reasons. On the technological side, uh, in October of that year, a, a Russian uh, command and control center uh, south of Moscow received warnings uh, of a, uh, an imminent launch of uh, nuclear weapons coming from the United States. The operator uh, who was uh, manning the station at that point refused to report this forward to Moscow, uh, hoping that it was a computer glitch. Uh, and it ultimately turned out to be a computer glitch. Uh, the Soviet radars are reading reflections of the cloud of sunlight off the clouds uh, as nuclear weapons or nuclear missiles coming from the United States to Russia. Uh, later that year, uh, during a NATO uh, a nuclear command control exercise called Able Archer, uh, the Soviet leadership uh, believed that, uh, in fact, uh, NATO was uh, preparing the grounds for a, a first strike against Russia, a surprise first strike against Russia. Uh, and began to uh, deploy its forces in order to respond quite forcefully uh, to a, a nuclear attack by NATO and only back down uh, when that exercise finally reached conclusion. Now, I would argue that uh, in one way, at least, the situation today is worse than it was in 1983. And that comes down to the direction of development. In 1983, uh, the Soviet Union really was at a turning point. Uh, as an older generation gave way to a younger generation that had a much more enlightened view uh, of what the Soviet Union's role in the world should be and how it should interact uh, with the world. So we saw the rise of Mikhail Gorbachev in the beginning of a, uh, a massive effort uh, to reform the Soviet Union, uh, to retrench, uh, to ease tensions with the West uh, and begin to uh, move away from a totalitarian society to a more open political system uh, based on a market economy. Today, we're moving in the opposite direction. Uh, you can see the positions in both the West uh, and in Russia hardening uh, against one another. President Joe Biden has recently talked of a world historical struggle between freedom and autocracy, uh, with clearly uh, Russia along with China on the other side. Uh, the Biden administration has put into place what I would call a hard-edged realism uh, that seeks to punish and isolate Russia, to turn Russia into a international pariah, and to cripple, if not crush, the Russian economy over the next several years. And if you look at what's happening in Russia, uh, I would argue that what we're seeing is the formation of a broad-based anti-Western consensus among the political elites. There was a small sliver of uh, Russian society, the Russian political elites that favored uh, closer relations with the United States and was working in that direction. With the onset of the, uh, of the conflict, hundreds of thousands of those individuals, as we know, fled to the West. Uh, but an interesting ha thing happened to those who remained inside Russia. In fact, two of them we'll hear from uh, later today. Uh, and that is uh, a turn against the West, a rethinking of what Russia's position should be with the West, uh, an understanding or a realization uh, that the conflict was going to be long uh, and it was going to have significant consequences uh, for the way the two societies in interacted over the, over the long term. Now, I think there are a number of reasons why you've seen uh, this turn uh, against the West, even among those uh, who earlier had uh, worked for cooperative relations, for those who had worked for Western companies uh, and enjoyed uh, uh, closer relations uh, with, with Europe and the United States. Uh, first is the sanctions regime. Uh, the sanctions regime uh, it has been structured in order to 
uh, harm the Russian economy, uh, its finances in particular, its long, uh, long-term capability to produce uh, modern, uh, modern weaponry and modern, uh, modern equipment for, for its economy. But I think it's also a fact that paradoxically, the sanctions that we've put in place have hit hardest among that sliver of Russian society that wanted closer relations with the West. Uh, and these are uh, individuals in what we might call the urban professional class, worked for Western companies, bought Western goods, liked to vacation in the West, sent their children uh, for education uh, in the West. And these people uh, had no uh, impact on the Russian decision to go to war, uh, are not uh, responsible for the conflict that is unfolding on the ground, and yet they are perhaps the ones uh, that are suffering the harshest consequences uh, of the sanctions, the ones that have uh, had the greatest damage done to their standard of living. Uh, and for them, that is a matter of uh, injustice on the part of the West and has led to the rethinking of the relationship uh, with Europe and the United States. Uh, second is the demonization of Russia uh, that we've seen throughout the West over the past several, several weeks, the cancellation uh, of Russian culture. Uh, the uh, the unwillingness in many places to, to teach Russian literature, uh, to play uh, the music of the great Russian composers, um, and so forth. Uh, and that has had an impact on the way uh, Russians think about the relationship with the West. Third factor is the fact that the United States and Europe are providing uh, significant weapons uh, to Ukraine at this point and plan to provide more in the future. And those weapons are being used to do what? to kill Russian soldiers. Uh, and you can imagine what the reaction would be uh, in Europe and in the United States uh, if Russians were providing uh, arms and equipment to kill American soldiers or European soldiers. We've been through that already in places like Afghanistan uh, and, and Iraq. And then the final factor uh, is this very rapid abandonment of Russia uh, by Western business, uh, the pulling up of stakes in response to the move uh, in the United States uh, and Europe, uh, but in a sense, leaving uh, many Russians uh, in the lurch. So we've seen this overall uh, turn against the United States uh, and, and, and Europe at this point. And so what we have is a great alienation between the West and Russia, a great alienation uh, that is going to endure uh, for several years at a minimum. Uh, and it's really going to be left to your generation uh, to deal with this, to see whether we you can figure out a way uh, in order to reconcile uh, the West and Russia uh, in, uh, and make the relationship much more constructive uh, than it has been uh, in the recent past and will likely be for the next several years, uh, if not decades into the future. Now, if we're going to be able to rebuild the relationship with Russia, I would argue that we need to think about Russia in strategic terms. Uh, we need to get past uh, current events for at least a moment to think about the type of Russia uh, we would like to, to see, uh, the type of relationship we would like to have Russia over the longer term, out 15 to 20 years from now. Uh, and in order to do that, there are four questions that we need to uh, consider. The first is the situation of the world today. The second is uh, the goals that the West are more uh, and I'll talk more about the United States. The United States is uh, pursuing at this point or should be pursuing at this point. Uh, third question is the nature of Russia and where it fits into the global equation at this point. And then the fourth uh, and the most important one is based on those first three uh, questions is what should we be trying to do with Russia over the long term? And what do we need to do in the short term to prepare the ground for that long term future? So let me start. Uh, with the state of the world today uh, and make one fundamental point. I think it's clear uh, that the world is at a, a major historical inflection point. Uh, it's going, the world is going to look very differently 10 for 15 years from now uh, than it's looked for the past uh, 15 to 20 years and indeed for decades. Uh, when people think about uh, great turning points in history, um, Immediately uh, comes to mind 1991, the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, the definitive end of the Cold War, uh, or 1938 uh, in, in Europe in particular, 
uh, the Munich uh, agreements uh, that laid the, the pathway to the Second World War, uh, which again led to uh, dramatic changes in the global balance of power and the way the world operated. Or 1914, uh, the beginning uh, of the, the march towards the, the First World War, which also had world historical consequences. But to my mind, uh, the, the period in history that's most analogous to our current uh, situation is the late 19th and early situation in early 20th century, a time when rapid change was outrunning our imaginations. Uh, and think about the, the comparisons between now and then. In the late 19th century, uh, Germany, a rising Germany, was challenging Britain for global dominance. And residing in the wings was an ever more powerful United States. Today, we have China challenging the United States uh, for global leadership. And we have a Russia reasserting its power uh, on the margins of that conflict between these two major countries. Back in the late 19th century, uh, we saw the wonders of the Industrial Revolution unfolding. Uh, technological advance uh, that was changing the way people thought, the way people uh, communicated, the way people worked, the way people uh, fought wars, the way that people re uh, conducted their, their, uh, their leisure activities. Uh, and all of this led to the first great wave of globalization. Now we have information, communications technology, which once again is changing the way we communicate, the way we work, uh, the way we uh, the way we relax, and indeed the way we conduct war. Back then, all this technological advance uh, was challenging the foundations of what up to that point had been uh, uh, societies that were very strong uh, on the religious side. And you saw the rise of secularism uh, as a dominant strain uh, in European and Western thinking. Today, we have all these technological advances that are making many people wonder uh, about the value of secularism uh, to solving uh, the human problems going forward. And you see that uh, in the rise of religious fundamentalism uh, across the globe. Now, if you look back at the late 19th century, you would see this accumulation of a tremendous amount of energy uh, that led uh, to uh, a great productive activity that laid the foundations for the prosperity uh, that we've seen uh, around the globe uh, in, the 20, in the 20th century and into the 20th first century, particularly in Europe and uh, the United States, but also uh, in many of the countries that we used to call uh, the third world. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this great uh, amount of change uh, also produced tremendous tension. And that tension uh, unleashed the demons of war, led to the ideologies uh, that fueled conflict and made the 20th century the bloodiest in human history. And so the challenge that we face today is to take advantage of the, uh, the technological progress, to lay the foundations for future prosperity, but at the same time, try to find a way to avoid uh, the major conflict that leads to so much death and destruction uh, in the short term. Uh, and as we uh, look at the conflict in Ukraine and we think about the possibilities, it's not clear uh, that uh, the world is going to be able to avoid those types of conflict. Again, this is a challenge for your generation to figure out the way to take advantage of the potential for a better and more prosperous life for uh, untold billions of people around the globe and at the same time avoid the descent uh, into conflict. Uh, that could have devastating consequences for, again, billions of people around the globe. Now, uh, this is the situation that I think we face in the world, um, and this is the, the challenge that the United States in particular is going to have to deal with going forward. Uh, the United States, I would argue, is in a, at a time when it needs to rethink its own mission in the world. Uh, we are clearly uh, still the dominant global power uh, by almost any, uh, by any measure. Uh, the United States has the largest economy in the world, uh, in nominal terms at least. It probably has the most capable 
military force in the world. We're a leading, if not the leading technological uh, power in the world today. Uh, the United States also has tremendous soft power, uh, despite the political disarray in the United States. If you look at our culture, uh, it's still valued uh, across the globe. But what is clear is that the margin of superiority that the United States has enjoyed over the past, uh, I would argue, uh, 70 decades, 80 decades since the end of the Second World War, is narrowing very rapidly uh, and has narrowed with increasing rapidity in the past decade uh, or so. Just give me one fact point. Uh, in 1960, uh, the United States accounted for roughly 40% of the global economy. Today, uh, according to the World Bank, uh, that figure is under 25%. Look at China. Uh, in 1960, China accounted for 4% uh, of the global economy. Today, it is 18% of the global economy. And the disparity in growth rates between the United States uh, and China is such uh, that most economists predict that sometime during this decade, China will overtake the United States as the largest economy uh, in nominal terms. Oh, it has already overtaken the United States in the past couple of years as the largest economy in the world in purchasing parity uh, terms. So the United States is finding that it no longer has the resources to dominate the globe the way it once did. Uh, and that it's going to have to work with more uh, different countries uh, to create the types of coalitions, the type of balance the United States will need over the long term uh, to advance its interest and its values. Now, the declining resources situation is exacerbated uh, by uh, the political disarray uh, in the United States. Uh, it is clear that we have major uh, socioeconomic problems uh, that we have to face up to and confront uh, many of these that we have put off dealing with for, uh, for the past uh, decade, decade uh, or, or longer. Uh, we have a profound polarization uh, in the United States. Uh, we talk of red states uh, and blue states uh, and see very little in common between, uh, between the two. And in the absence of this unity, uh, it's very difficult for an administration to tap the resources that we still have, the tremendous resources we still have to advance American goals on the, on the global stage. And so the first, uh, and I think most significant challenge and task for the United States is actually to put its own house in order, uh, to try to rebuild a sense of uh, national unity, a consensus about what the role of the United States should be in the world uh, and how we should conduct our foreign policy going forward. Uh, the United States also needs uh, to deal with this political disarray, overcome uh, the polarization in our society, uh, to build up our educational system uh, so that the United States can maintain its technological edge uh, in the years ahead. And that also means that the United States uh, is going to have to maintain very close contacts with those other centers of technological innovation across the globe uh, that foster uh, even greater uh, creativity uh, among, uh, among the world's scientists. Uh, so there is a major domestic challenge uh, that lies before the United States. Uh, when we think about uh, the global environment, uh, as I said, the United States is not going to be in a position to dominate the world at once, uh, as it once did. Uh, we can talk about a U.S.-led international order, uh, but increasingly, uh, if there's going to be an international order, it's going to have to be an order that is led by the United States uh, and many, many other countries. Uh, in a multipolar environment, such as the one that we have today, uh, the challenge for the United States is to build a global equilibrium uh, among the major powers, uh, the middle range powers, uh, that is favorable to the advance of American interests and values around the globe. And what that means is that the United States, at a minimum, is going to have to have functioning and one would hope constructive relations with all the other major global powers. That includes China, uh, that includes Europe, that includes India, that includes Japan, and that, I would argue, includes Russia as well. Uh, this gets to the third question of where Russia fits in. Uh, Russia, to my mind, 
to my mind, is going to be a key pillar of the global system for many, many years, indeed decades, into the future. Uh, despite the fact that it's clear that Russia faces its own significant set uh, of domestic problems that will challenge the, the wisdom and abilities of its leadership uh, in the years ahead. But we need to remember uh, that Russia is still the largest country in the world, spanning 11 time zones. It's still the country with the largest endowment of natural resources by far uh, in the world today, including all those uh, elements that are necessary for modern uh, production, uh, modern production, mo mo modern, uh, modern manufacturing, uh, particularly uh, the production of the electronics uh, that have become such a central factor in socioeconomic and political life uh, around the globe. Uh, the United, uh, Russia also, as we've learned, uh, uh, particularly over the past, uh, past uh, couple of months, uh, is one of the richest countries and agricultural resources. Uh, after the uh, trying times of the Soviet Union, Russia has returned as a major exporter of agricultural goods, uh, particularly grain, and become a central uh, factor uh, in the global food equation. Uh, Russia also retains a vast nuclear arsenal, one of the two great nuclear uh, superpowers in the world today. And that is going to be a significant element until we figure out a way uh, to eliminate nuclear weapons uh, as a uh, an element of uh, of warfare, uh, uh, and that might, uh, to my mind, is something that will only occur uh, in the very distant future. Uh, Russia also has a tremendous wealth of oil and gas, uh, which is going to make it a key player on the global stage as long as fossil fuels uh, remain a significant element in the energy mix. And once again, despite the promise of renewables. Uh, and, other, uh, and other efforts that uh, the West in particular is undertaking to deal with the problems of climate change, oil and gas are still going to be a major component of the energy mix 15, 20, and 30 years into the future. And finally, uh, Russia has a geographic location uh, that makes it uh, an important player in all the major zones of economic uh, an industrial activity in the world today. It borders on Europe, it borders on, uh, on Northeast Asia, it borders on South Asia, uh, it borders on the Middle East, uh, which is not so much a, a, uh, a major industrial uh, center, but does retain uh, a, uh, natural resources that are critical to the global economy. And finally, Russia also borders on the Arctic. Uh, an area that is being opened up by, by climate change and actually gives Russia uh, something of a border with that last major center uh, of global economic activity, which is North America. Uh, so Russia, to my mind, will remain a, uh, a central pillar of the global uh, environment going forward. Now, you hear and you have heard in the recent uh, past uh, a lot of conversation about uh, how brittle the Russian system is, uh, and the potential for uh, the Russia uh, to disintegrate uh, the way uh, the way the Soviet Union did in the late 1980s and early 1990s. I think that uh, uh, that assessment is well overdrawn. Uh, the fact is that in, that Russia now, uh, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, is largely uh, an ethnic Russian country. 80% of the population uh, is ethnic Russian. And I know of no case in history uh, where a country that homogenous has broken up. Indeed, the only country uh, of tremendous ho 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 homogeneity that came close to breaking up was actually the United States in the middle of the 19th century uh, during the Civil War. Um, so uh, simply on the basis of that uh, a situation, it is unlikely that Russia is going to break up uh, over the, uh, over the uh, uh, not over the long term, but in, uh, in a very near, in the near future. There's a potential, of course, to lose the North Caucasus um, for various reasons. Uh, always been a troubled part of the, of the Russian state, the Russian empire, but the loss of the North Caucasus does very little to change Russia's global position uh, as a major power. Uh, in world affairs. Uh, if Russia uh, 
is going to uh, disintegrate. Uh, it's not going to disintegrate because of domestic reason. It will have to be broken up. Uh, and that would require outside powers uh, to try to undermine uh, and seize parts of the Russian state. I think the Russian state uh, will be strong enough to prevent that. And certainly we have seen no uh, country along Russia's borders that has uh, evinced any interest in trying to seize Russian territory uh, over the uh, in the past uh, uh, in the past decade, and I see none on the horizon that would look uh, to that goal uh, in, in the next uh, two, three, or one more decades. So Russia is going to remain a significant global actor, and the United States is going to have to deal with it. And that comes to the final question of what we should be trying to do with Russia today, uh, and the challenges that we face. Uh, how do we deal with the short-term crisis in order to uh, have a long-term constructive relationship with Russia, uh, a relationship that allows us to make Russia a central actor uh, in a new global, global equilibrium uh, that advances American interests and advances American values? How do we uh, include Russia in a way that helps us channel China's growing power and ambitions in ways that are not harmful uh, to American interest uh, and uh, American values. Um, obviously, the, uh, the conflict in Ukraine creates a, a tremendous challenge uh, for how we think about this and what we do. Uh, it, Russia is challenging the United States now uh, across a broad range uh, of issues. And Ukraine, uh, uh, for all the focus that it's received in recent months, uh, re is really only one element of a much broader challenge. Um, and that is the uh, one uh, that we're going to have to deal with, the challenge to European security, uh, the challenge uh, to the rules-based international order, uh, the growing alignment with, with China uh, that undermines uh, American, uh, American interests going forward. So what, what should we be doing now in order to prepare the ground uh, for a more constructive relationship with Russia. Uh, first, uh, I would argue uh, that the United States, the West more broadly speaking, uh, has a, an interest in thwarting whatever Russia's ambitions are in Ukraine uh, at this point, um, in defeating uh, Russia's grandest ambition, territorial ambitions uh, with regard to Ukraine. And that means that the United States, the West more broadly, to be continuing to provide Ukraine with the weapons that it needs in order to push back against the, uh, the Russian assault. Uh, we need to build up our deterrent uh, capabilities uh, in NATO, particularly in the, the countries, the vulnerable countries along the NATO Russia frontier, the Baltic states, Poland, uh, Romania, uh, Bulgaria to a lesser extent. Uh, we need to integrate uh, quickly Sweden and Finland into NATO. I think a, a significant element of deterrence uh, and defense uh, in the North uh, uh, when we deal with Russia and creating as much of a united Europe and united West uh, as we possibly can uh, in order to, to deal uh, with the Russia challenge. Uh, and doing this, I think, is critical uh, to creating an environment in which sometime in the future, we can normalize relations with Russia uh, and begin to construct uh, a, a more durable European uh, security architecture. I think we need to understand uh, how difficult this is going to be because uh, what we're undertaking in the West now uh, is, in a sense, uh, a, an effort that expands the Euro Atlantic uh, community eastward to Russia's border and pushes. Russia out of Europe as a major actor. Uh, and as we all know, historically, Russia's interaction with NATO, its ability to influence developments on the continent has been a significant element of the way it thinks of itself as a great power. And when you think about it, Russia demonstrated that it was a great, uh, that it was a great power uh, on the great European battlefield over the past two to three centuries at the great diplomatic conferences. Think of the Conference of Vienna, uh, the Alta Conference, for example. And so psychologically, uh, we have to deal with the fact uh, that Russia is being driven out of Europe. Uh, and that has an impact on the way they're going to relate to Europe going forward. 
Uh, so we need to, as I said, first to uh, thwart Russia's ambitions in Ukraine, uh, but we also need to do this uh, in a way that leaves open the possibility for more constructive relations uh, in the future. And the two challenges I think we face, uh, which are quite complex, uh, which I won't go into great detail, but I'll just uh, lay them out now, uh, and I'll leave it to you to, to try to think of the solutions, is that we need to pursue our policy in Ukraine in a way that one doesn't further alienate Russia, uh, that we need to demonstrate uh, that there is a way back for Russia to more constructive relations uh, once this conflict is over, and depending on how that conflict ends. That means that the United States uh, and the West uh, needs to, to recognize that Russia does have legitimate security concerns. We need to convey in our words and our actions that we're prepared to deal in a responsible uh, fashion with those uh, security concerns uh, going forward, and that there is, in fact, a way in which Russia can feel secure uh, as uh, along with the countries of Europe uh, and the United States, more broadly speaking. Uh, the second uh, is that we need to uh, structure our sanctions regime uh, in a way uh, that uh, doesn't totally cripple the, uh, the Russian economy over the long term. Uh, we don't want to see uh, the, the cratering of the Russian economy. We need a country uh, for our own purposes uh, that might not be as strong as the Soviet Union was in challenging us, uh, but not so weak uh, that it can govern uh, in an effective fashion this vast territory uh, that, it, uh, that it occupies and controls at this point. Uh, how we do that, uh, I think, is a, a difficult question. We need to target our sanctions in a way that undermine Russia's ability to conduct uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, but not in such a way uh, that we eliminate the future foundations uh, of economic growth that will allow Russia uh, to be a, a major actor, uh, to be a, a major uh, technological power uh, over the longer term. And so we need to create or lay the foundations for Russia uh, that can work with the United States and be a, an important uh, and constructive player on the global stage. Uh, both these questions, the alienation of Russians uh, and uh, the crippling of the, uh, uh, the Russian economy are two big issues uh, that are being debated in Washington today, uh, but I don't think by any stretch of the imagination uh, that we have come to a firm conclusion or the right policy uh, as we go forward. We seem to be much more focused on dealing with the immediate challenge than thinking of the long-term way uh, we're going to structure relations in the future. Now, uh, let me just end by saying uh, that uh, you know we do face, uh, as I've argued, a very uh, challenging time, uh, a, a moment of rapid change. Uh, but I also think that this is an, a very, very exciting time, uh, for particularly for people uh, of your generation. Look over the next 15 to 20 years or longer. Uh, you have a real opportunity uh, to shape the world uh, in positive ways uh, that will endure for, for generations behind you uh, and create a much more prosperous and safer world. Uh, in many ways, uh, uh, what you're seeking to do, what you hope to do, uh, is what Western leaders did at the very end of the Second World War uh, in creating uh, a world uh, that uh, led to uh, at least 70 or 80 years of prosperity uh, around the world and growing security uh, for Europe, the United States, and much of the rest of the world. As I said, that world is at risk at this point. We will have a new order. What it will look like depends very much on the choices that your generation makes over the next 10, 15 years and beyond. So let me end there, uh, and I am happy to entertain your questions. Mm -hmm.